morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see you. Will you stand and worship together with us this morning? since the middle of the week. So here I am, and uh, trying to bring you um, a, a welcome and um, just a, a challenge uh, here today to uh, try to take what we see in, in God's Word and uh, apply it to our lives. Um, kind of going along with the theme of, of today's 
um, message. Is Don Veland here today? No, he's not. Well, we'll go ahead with it anyways. Um, with that, the elders in the church stand up for a second. All right, Mark and, oh, and Todd and myself and, and Don Beeland. Uh, so take a look around. If you don't know who the elders are, this is uh, the elders. And Don, you can't miss because he probably stops by and encourages you. And Don is a great encourager. So um, if you don't know who he is, find out next week. And uh, if you're a deacon, could you, could you stand up as well? A number of deacons here. I don't know if they're all here, but we've got a good selection of deacons here today. Thank you, guys. And I just wanted to uh, introduce you all because so many new people stop in here. And, and the elders here are, are dedicated to serve you by, by leading and teaching. And the deacons here are, are dedicated to um, seeing your needs and, and making sure that we as a body can meet them. So I wanted to start off by saying that. I also... Um, wanted us to celebrate an event that happened Friday. Do we have a picture of that, Maya? Or, but they're not here. You'll have to uh, save your applause if you really want to embarrass them next week. Uh, they may be back for our small group tonight. So, but They said they were, but I, I wouldn't put money on it. But that was Friday night, and it was awesome. And um, there may still be some people there. I don't know. They were living it up when I left. So, um, a couple other things that I wanted to mention uh, are Wednesday night events. Uh, family night is starting on the 21st. So, if you um, want to come out in the middle of the week and get a, a little more, a little restoration, a little uh, kick to get you through the rest of the week, there is a place for everyone from 1 to 101. And if you're under one or more than 101, we'll find a place for you there as well. So uh, please come out on Wednesday night and join. Ask somebody near you what happens there, and we'll set you up. Um, new member, new covenant members class, if you want to become a member of this church, or you just want to learn more about us, uh, talk to an elder about that. We've got one planned but not scheduled. So uh, we have a number of people looking forward to that. So. Uh, we'll be scheduling that pretty soon. And take a look in your bulletin. We've got a women's event coming up and all kinds of other stuff in the bulletin. So uh, with that, we'll open up our service with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you here this morning to unite us, humble us, gather us, love us, touch us with your love, attach your word to our hearts, help us to worship you. Help us to understand your word and apply it to our lives. We need your help, Lord, in all of these things. So be with us here. Guide us towards your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue in worship together. Isaiah 12, 4 says, Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted.
whole, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ.
without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. folks. I am Todd Russell. I'll be handling the ministry minute today. And uh, last night I made a point to sit down and let, jot down a bunch of ideas. And I ran out of the house this morning and those ideas are on, on, my, on my, my bench next to my chair. <laughs> so bear with me. So um, um, ministry minute, we decided it was very important to uh, keep the body uh, abreast of what's going on uh, here at Hope in Christ. Um, what I'm going to do here today, in this moment, it'll be moments, um, is to take a look back at our meeting we had on Tuesday, just give you some feedback, share with you an anecdote, okay, story that I, I want to connect with you uh, as a human being and, and being transparent, um, but also, also share some, some needs of some ministry needs, okay? So let's take a look back on t Tuesday, six at, uh, September 6th at 6 p.m. we had a ministry um, meeting here and it's our second one we've had this year it, it's very good to get everyone together who's leading a ministry or wants to learn more about it in one room and just share what's going on and when we do that we can hear um what what good's going on and some of the challenges and maybe even have like a breakout work session how to improve those um so just a takeaway from from that meeting we had hey we're not perfect and we're trying to improve so we're improving um but one takeaway that for me, for what I heard, was uh, communication. Um, there is a ministry that will send out a need. It goes out, echoes, 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 but nothing comes back. <laughs> so we want to kind of improve that. And I, I'm guilty of that. I um, want to improve that. Um, so if, uh, if Cry for Help comes out, hey, I need, we need this for somebody, it can respond saying, I got your email, I can't do it. That helps the person who's in charge know that you're not you got it and if you can so we want to improve returning responding to e emails we also talked about that maybe the type of communication that we use isn't always the best like for me i know email and, and and then texting i don't know anything else but there are other platforms that we can use we want to discuss how we can improve our communication but it was good to hear the hearts and the challenges and what's good going on here at open christ church with the ministry leaders and those who are participating. And I want to say thank you to all of you who have been serving faithfully. You're serving on many different uh, ministries, so thank you. Um, something that is great is uh, if you are new coming through these doors and God's called you here and you're a believer, you've got gifts, our ch church, the body, you and I are the church, is always going to change because you're coming in or people are leaving and you've got different gifts and different talents different sets of times, so we need to be figuring out how we can serve the body, okay? That's, that's our challenge. Um, fall time, so we're kicking off our fall events, meaning we're starting up the new uh, church year, uh, so to speak, is, is uh, 921, that's our Wednesday night activities. And for myself, boy, it's like uh, the last day of school. I had this uh, summer to myself. When we end the uh, Wednesday night programs, my, my summer, opens wide up for me to do the things that I want to do. So when it comes time for September, boy, there's a tug in my heart. Mm, here's the things that I could do and have been doing, having lots of fun. Um, the tug of, boy, the things I want to do and the things that need to get done, wherever it may be, um, there's a tug of war. Is it selfishness? I don't know, but for me, 
I feel it in September, late October, of things that need to restart up again. So that's teaching kids church. It, it could be Awana. It could be whatever the it is. Um, so I feel that every single year uh, when I start back up in September, the recommitment. What am I recommitting to? It's a good starting place to start over again. So there's just me. So there's the past. Here is the anecdotal story, the anecdotal story. So I want you to listen to the story I'm telling you. I want to connect with you. Find out where I went wrong, what I did right, and you're gonna, hopefully you'll enjoy it. We decided as husband and wife that we needed to get our daughter into some sort of organized sport. For her and for us, it was, we needed to do that. And soccer was one of those things. So we enrolled her back, I don't know, in July, August, early August, and we didn't hear anything at all. We're like, okay, it needs to happen. Fall's coming. Um, we finally got a communication on a Sunday, two weeks ago, the 28th, the 28th of August, saying the town of Loudoun cannot do girls soccer because we don't have coaches. I'm like, man. So we pause you there. We have made mistakes in the past by enrolling our kids, two kids, into uh, sports, and my gosh, we're running over the place. I, we're like, why do we do this? So we stopped that, and then we did it again. Um, so... <laughs> But while I was attending, watching as a parent, sitting in my chair, comfortable watching the kids and the coaches, I thought to myself, I could do that. I'm here. I'm already here. So that's the hard part. I'm here. I could do that. So I filed that away, you know, years ago. I could do that. Do you do that any time else? If you come to church and you see there's a need, I'm here. I can do that, but I'm not going to do it. So back to the 28th of August. We're driving, and Lori gets the email. Hey, we can't do soccer. Well, we need soccer. So I said, you know what, Lori? I can do that. I can be a coach. How hard can it be? Right? <laughs> I know nothing about soccer. I love, except in third grade, I played it, and I failed men miserably. But I, but I know people who play soccer. I said, hey, Lori, text Asia and text Mark. They're going to be my consultants. I can do this. Okay, so they agreed, and also it was two days, Thursdays and Saturdays. I can do that. Well, when the email came, it's not two days. Those are your game days. You got to practice too. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So I get the email from Brienne on Monday, and it's dump downloads and emails, and I'm like, oh my gosh. I woke up. Monday morning at 3 a.m. What did I get myself into? I know nothing about soccer. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got to work Tuesday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. What am I going to do? I don't know anything about soccer. I missed the meeting. So as I go through the week, this burden of stress, I'm like, I don't know. And I had made a commitment, so I got to honor my commitments. I felt like I'd sign a blank check. Okay? <laughs> And scripture would come to my mind from Proverbs. I mean, I know this stuff. I know this. I shouldn't have done this. I should have been more thoughtful. You don't think the way at 3 a.m. as you do at like 3, 3 in the afternoon. So I left for work Friday, the weekend before Labor Day, and I was sharing my, my stress with the family, Anale, and she dutifully emailed me YouTube videos to watch on how to be a coach. <laughs> So I watched them during my lunch break on that Friday, how to get, how to be a coach, and you need to communicate to the, to the team, set up time practices. I'm like, okay, I can do this. I just haven't done it before. Sweating bullets, Laura, I got home. I need to do this before the weekend because I'm the coach. Um, so that afternoon, uh, I was out getting ready to make a, a, some pizza by the, by the fire, and I hear Lori answer the phone. I could tell she doesn't know who she's talking to. And she comes out, and she says, Todd, I just spoke to Coach Jared, okay? He's coaching the team. <sighs> this weight was lifted, <laughs> amen. So there was some miscommunication. Uh, there is a need. Um, coaches, coaches, this is his third year. I'm helping him, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm able to learn. So kind of like uh, there is a need. 
I wanted to fill it. Square peg, round hole. I'm the square peg, round hole. So we had our first game on Thursday, or I'll practice on Wednesday. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm learning. I'm watching and I'm learning. Uh, I'm jumping in to do that. So there's the anecdote story. Um, I kind of look like a coach, um, but I'm <laughs> faking it. Um, so there's the anecdote story. Some of the things I made a mistake was um, I didn't go before the Lord to ask him if it's okay for me to be doing this. I knew that at 3 o'clock in the morning. There was a confession and, and prayer. Um, so checking in with the Lord was an important thing. But um, some things I do know, I saw a need, and it needed to be met. Uh, that We talked last Monday about if it's okay to let something fall. That's hard. Because if you're in a ministry and you're leading it, boy, what's that reflect upon? You, someone's need's not going to get met. They, there could be hurt feelings. All that emotion stuff. So we talked about that in, in our meeting. So there are needs. So the, my story about uh, playing soccer, um, there's hope you can apply that to your life, some takeaways. But um, coming up, so there are some needs, and specifically uh, for Awana and, and tech. Um, so we're starting back up Awana again. We, we, we can get by. I mean, we can do it. But it can be vastly improved. And it's not hard. So for Awana, it's an hour and a half. Depending on which class there, there is, there's, there's cubbies. There's the Sparkies, and then there's the TNTs. Depending on what time that is, you have an hour block of time with the kids to teach them, have fun, talk about life, or it's, an, it's a half hour block of game time uh, in, in between. So you two have two half hours with a half hour of game time or an hour, uh, just to have fun with the kids um, in a spiritual setting, you know, with the lens of, of Jesus Christ. That's how I do it. I've been doing this for several years. So what are the needs, okay? Um, we need commanders, uh, a commander. It could be a, a single person, or it could be if you are a couple, that's even great. Um, so there's some leadership. Is it hard? You open up uh, the, uh, the Awana cer ceremony at, at six o'clock, uh, and you just kind of coordinate, uh, keep us on track. That's what the commander does. Uh, there's other responsibilities, but uh, we can learn more about that. Um, there is uh, a, a change, so a big thank you for those who are uh, rotating off for your dutiful service to Awana over the years in loving on our kids. Thank you for that. Um, we have a need for uh, a helper in cubbies, and I don't know the ages. Help me out with the ages for cubbies. Uh, three to five. Three to five, okay. So um, Debbie Beeland is the teaching that, but she said she could either teach that or step aside as a helper, someone else who wants to teach. Uh, with that, and there'll be parents in there who are with their kids anyway. So there's a, a, a teacher's helper in cubbies. Uh, Sparkies, uh, we have a helper. There was a, um, a parent who uh, was leaving the uh, cubbies to go with their child to Sparkies, so you have a teacher's helper there. You need a teacher, okay, to help out in, in Sparkies. TNT, that's myself and Robbie, we team teach. Um, I can step aside or let someone else. I mean, there, there's opportunities if you want to. Um, try out teaching, okay? Um, but myself and, and, and Robbie are doing um, TNTers. There's some snack uh, helpers. If you just can give us some time, uh, an hour and a half or an hour, uh, the intake startup administration is kind of hectic from uh, maybe 10 of 6 till 6.05, getting the kids in, in, in process. So there's a need uh, in Awana. Uh, we, we can get by, but we, we should be doing better. Um, if you've got time, uh, and, and you have breath, like your pastor said, there's a spot here for you on, on Wednesday evenings, either growing spiritually or helping out. Um, and now the tech. Um, I can remember when I was in 10th grade, Mrs. Judkins teaching geometry with the overhead projector. Okay, remember the, the piece of plastic with the black ink on it? Okay, well, that's when, we, when I first started coming here, we had that. Now we've got this technology. We need help every single Sunday running the technology. So that's the visual aids, that's pretty, I can do it uh, with Maya's help, I, I can get that. Thank you, Maya. So there's, um, so there's a need for that, but also the, the audio sound, and that takes you know, the ear, uh, and maybe some science up behind that, but looking for a couple that kind of own that, I mean, we can get by where it's, we're trying to just staff it. So the commitment would be uh, either a couple weeks a month to do that, um, or even longer, or, or just you can do one weekend. We've lost, um, for whatever re reason, people, uh, babies kind of change our lives a little bit. Um, so people have kind of ro rotated off. So tech, um, 
Tech and Iwana, but not just there, but anywhere else, if God's calling you here to um, jump in, uh, not be the square peg in a round hole, but maybe you can do that. I'm learning. Uh, it's unco- I haven't been in this spot in a very long time, and it's good to be, be there uncomfortable. So I'm, I'm appreciative, but I should have checked in with God first. So I'm asking you to check in with God first, where you can serve here at Hope in Christ Church. And the ask for today is Awana or, or Tech, okay? So I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed my Anik little story. And let's go on the rest of the service. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Todd. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you do decide you would like to teach uh, at Awana, that is prepared material. It is prepared. And they just, you facilitate the material. So, um, and try to keep them from duct taping you to the wall. Um, you know what, I, we, we should start with, and, and the elders are working on this, but uh, yeah, turn the mic on, right? Thank you. <laughs> Hand signals. Um, <laughs> Um, we do have made some progress, Todd uh, and, and Mark as well, uh, have made some progress on our driveway issue that I addressed last week. And, and uh, what, we, what we're going to be doing most likely in some way is going to put us over our building and grounds budget. Um, when our, the numbers are um, more finely tuned, we will bring that to you um, to vote on. And um, just, just watch for emails on that because, um, you know, the, the, the cost of it, it isn't exorbitant, but it is something that you approved our budget for last year. We're exceeding it, so we, we want to come bring this project to you. Um, suffice to say, our driveway is becoming somebody else's driveway, and uh, it's not a good good policy to have our dirt and somebody else's dirt because uh, they don't want our dirt. You know, um, just look left when you leave, and you'll see what we're talking about. There's the beginning of a Grand Canyon out there. Um, You know, if you want to get connected to this church, want to hear more about what you do, and the seat in front of you is a Connect card, it'll get you on our email list, and you'll you'll learn all about what we do weekly. Flip that over, and it's a prayer request card, and you uh, can drop that in the collection uh, box that's by each exit, and um, and and we'll be able to uh, to pray for you as elders or as a church, whatever you um, decide. And of course. those boxes there also to accept your generous offerings, which we thank you so much for. Um, you know, we're looking at budget numbers over the summer that, that uh, show just how generous that you have been. Um, I'm not going to disappoint you this week. I am going to mess up another uh, New Covenant member's vote. So I, I think pretty much uh, four in a row. So at least I'm consistent. Um, uh, we are allowed to conduct church business on Sunday um, in, in one way only, and that is to vote uh, new members into church um, covenant membership. And this week, the, uh, the elders would like to recommend Josh and Lizzie Planchette. Would you stand up? So um, if all members here would uh, voice their agreement with the elders' recommendation by the word aye, aye. and any opposed would no. Amen. Uh, welcome to Covenant Membership. And we were able to uh, hear both of them at our Saturday night service, which I would highly recommend to come to every second Saturday night at the old church. And Josh brought us a great message, and uh, Lizzie was pounding out the worship on the uh, on the keyboard so we're really we're really happy to have them have them here 
Uh, what else did I have written down here? Right. Um, you know, this is the 11th of September, and, and we need to remember and support our first responders. Um, you know, we know that our battle is with the elemental spirits, you know, and we, and we know God wants us to focus on the spiritual as aspect of our lives, right? We, we can't get um, distracted by the difficulties that we endure here in this world that's opposed to God, but boy, we gotta protect ourselves. We gotta know there's dangers out there. So, um, on this day, we need to remember those sacrifices. So at this time, it's children's church time. So, if you are a parent and you have some kids, what are they already vamoose? Did they sneak out or we just have a few less this week? Well, while the parents get their kids established in the kids' church, um, why don't we jump up and say hi to somebody we haven't seen in a long time, like Derek, and uh, he can tell you all about his major wound and show you his scars and stuff. And uh, we'll be back into God's Word in just a minute. I think we're pretty well set as far as getting the kids established. Um, if we can get back to our seats here, we'll crack open the Word of God and see what He has to say to us this week. Uh, I will also be bouncing off of um, our ministry leaders meeting that we had on Tuesday, which all you were all invited to, by the way. Um, and that message that I started out with uh, bounced off of the pastoral vision for 2022 that, that I gave in, in, uh, in January. And it had to do with uh, the topic of leadership development and how that um, 
the leaders of the ministries and leaders in the church should be not just doing, but, but, but teaching as they do. They should be looking around them and seeing who is around them uh, that can learn this, that can maybe have gifts to do this as well. And not just teaching what we do. I mean, that's really what I've been convicted over the last eight or nine months, is I, I just don't need to show people what to do. I need to show people why we're doing it. Uh, and, and in the, the spirit of that, um, you know, I've really been kind of convicted about us as a body. This is, a, you know, this is you know, September, so this is like the start of the church year almost. Um, so before I brought you another series of sermons through a book of the Bible, I wanted to preach a sermon on how we live as a church body under the headship of Christ. We've got people coming to this church from all over the place. And it's a big mistake of mine to think that everybody understands church like I do. Um, we all have had different experiences, come from different churches. So, so you know, I, I really wanted to, to preach this, this one standalone sermon uh, to get us headed in the right direction. And I think that it's one that we will refer back to, I hope, for years to come. Not just this sermon, but, but, but this principle in, from God's word. And um, we're going to do that from what many would consider an unlikely place. It would be uh, Matthew chapter 18. So while you turn there... Um, you know, many of you guys may recognize, you know, Matthew 18 as, as, as one that includes church discipline, right? Chapter, I mean, uh, verses 15 through 20. And technically that is true, but, but it's very simplistic. It, you know, that you can just take those six verses and, and, and read them and apply them how we desire, right? They need to be applied in the context of, in which they were given to us, which is the entire chapter of Matthew 18 and really back to Matthew 16, right? And I, I wouldn't call all that church discipline. I would, I would call it how to live in unity as a church body. And it's important for us to understand for, for two main reasons. It's instituted by Christ himself. And secondly, it takes into account our weaknesses, our sinfulness, our, our temptations, our vulnerabilities. You know, this isn't a surprise to God that we stumble and fall. You know, reading through this chapter really shows the importance that Jesus places on living in a united fellowship as a church. You know, and, and it took me a little while to figure out how I was going to present this. Um, but we do. You're all facing this way, right? But in the back, um, we take attendance every week. But we don't do that to see who's coming. We do that to see who's not coming. Because some, there's a lot going on here. And we miss things. And we're busy. So somebody could miss two, three, four weeks or more. And maybe we wouldn't notice. So we need to be able to check that once in a while. See who may need our help. But hasn't mentioned it. And it's happened. And that's why we do it. And if you look through that white book, there's 168 people listed there. And I was thinking, how in the world is it going to be possible for 168 people to be unified in how they think and act about living together as a church family? Now, I only came up with one way, and, and if you come up with another way, let me know. Because maybe it's better. But I thought of it as... Like having a room with 168 pianos in it, right? You wouldn't try to tune those pianos to each other. It would be a big mess. You would tune them all to the same tuning fork. And then they would automatically be tuned to each other. Right? They're tuned to one perfect standard, not to each other. Right? And that's what I was thinking about when we work through Matthew 18. One congregation of 168 Christians living together, each one looking to Christ for leadership. Right? In their hearts and minds, they're closer to each other than they could ever be that way than if they tried, you know, to be unified. You know, let's show up here and really try to be unified. That's not going to work. We all have different ideas we all have different plans. We all have different 
definitions of what that would work for. But if we all look at how Christ wants us to be unified, we're automatically working in the same direction. And that's the main principle that I wanted to bring from Matthew 18 and the one thing that I hope you take home from this message. That God brought this church together and he gave us a plan and a power to stay that way. And that's what I see in Matthew 18. Um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I'm going to take it in five chunks because I don't, I don't want us to be all overwhelmed and bite off more than we can chew. But really the important part of this is that we see it in one teaching. One of the reasons it's important is because it contains a couple of the most misused and misquoted portions of Scripture in the whole Bible. You know, mostly because people feel as though that they can just pluck a verse out of its context and, and, and place it willy-nilly into different parts of their lives. Don't do that. That's why we preach through whole books of the Bible here. But once you establish that context and you understand who wrote it and you understand the, the uh, reason he wrote it and you understand the audience that you're, 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 you're um, immersed in that context. So you automatically understand the principles. So in the context of Matthew 18, this is, this is very late in the ministry of Jesus, right? It's in between his transfiguration, right? When, when he showed um, his true identity as the Son of God, the Messiah that's come to save sinners to uh, three of the disciples, in between that and his triumphant uh, entry back into Jerusalem. So he's worked his way back this last maybe 10 months of his life, of his ministry, back from Syria all the way back down through, heading back to Jerusalem to offer himself up as a sacrifice so that all who believe and repent will be forgiven their sins. And this is what happens. It's the time when Jesus is continuing more and more and more. If you read that part of, 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 of Jesus' travels, he, more and more and more he's revealing himself to the disciples as the Messiah, as the Son of God, sent to save sinners. He's preparing his disciples for his departure and what's going to happen afterwards, right? The arrival of the Holy Spirit, the establishment of the church. And then, like in what we're going to be looking at here today, after the church is established, it's health and it's perseverance through difficulty. Right? And church... Right? We've been through this before, but I'll say it. You know, Ecclesia is the, the called ones. Right? The people that God calls to faith through the forgiveness of sins by Jesus' atoning death on the cross. It's a group of believers, not a building and not an event. Right? And Jesus only uses the word church three times. Matthew 16 and twice in Matthew 18. It's all about preparing us for this life of fellowship. Right? Matthew 16. Jesus says, yes, Peter, I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah sent to save sinners. And I will build my church. Right? This is his church. So it makes his teaching so important. Right? He's going to tell us how to keep that church that he is building from falling apart. And, and we're looking at five, uh, five different principles here today. And the first one... See, Christians can live and love together in a local church because of their humility before God for their own salvation. Right? At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the king of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Right? This, this group of disciples that are gathered around Jesus in, in Matthew 18 is not the church, not yet. But they are a group of believers looking to Jesus for leadership and teaching. It's a model of the church that Jesus has assembled here. And he's introducing principles which will guide the church once it's established in Acts chapter 2. And the disciples are trying to set up some kind of hierarchy amongst themselves. Right? Who is the best in the kingdom of heaven? And of course in Matthew we understand that this is a Jewish um, writer writing to the Jews. So he's not going to use the word God. 
So kingdom of heaven used in Matthew is, is just like the, the, the phrase kingdom of God in the other gospels, right? It, it's God's reign over our lives, God's reign over the universe, God's reign in his future kingdom. Who is best, Jesus? Guys, right? I've been preaching and modeling sacrifice, selflessness, and humility for three years now. I have all the authority from God, and this is what you're asking me? I'm guessing another Jesus face palm moment, you know? So here in these verses, Jesus is preparing us for the same situation in our churches. And he responds to it first with this great equalizer. The sinfulness, the helplessness, and the humble condition necessary to receive God's reign in our lives. Right? Little children is how Jesus is referring to a believer because they come to him in weakness and humility like a child. This is unifying. Because we're all recipients of God's grace and mercy for our salvation. None of us had a head start because we're better than somebody else. Right? But when you first start coming to church, you see one guy up front preaching, right? You see a group of elders who lead and teach, right? They, 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 they lead the corporate prayer. We have a worship leader that leads us in worship. We have 20-something people at the ministry leader meeting the other night. Involved in some way leading in the church. But what you've got to see is how it was God's grace alone that put them there. And what you're seeing is just a display of different gifting. And what you don't see at first is the weightiness of that call to ministry that's on that person's shoulders and occupies that believer's heart and mind. And what you see in a, in a local church like this one is not levels of importance, but just difference in spiritual gifting from God and a difference in the opportunities God's giving people to serve in their particular season of life. When we look at it in this way, or we welcome it, as verse 5 puts it, we welcome Jesus himself. That's what that means. We're showing him that he is indeed the head here. We're agreeing with him that we have no order of greatness among us. But verse 6 gives us that warning. Right? You start setting up this hierarchy of importance inside a church, you're going to cause the faithful to stumble or possibly fall into sin. And to show how serious Jesus is about that point, you saw what he says is befitting that. It right? would be better if you were tied to a rock in the bottom of the ocean. This is a call for humility in the church because of our common heritage, wretches saved by grace. How can we think we're greater than others because of what is God has done? It'd be like taking credit for getting an inheritance from an uncle you didn't even know. Really. It should make us feel blessed, humble, not proud. You know, uh, last night and then you know, at our small group and, and, and different times throughout the year, I, I come to understand that testimonies do a great job in this, of keeping us unified. Right? I know the youth group uses them um, to help establish this, this, this equalness as well. Um, we, saw, we heard testimony last night, um, and it did not disappoint. It gives us all a lot to think about. It, 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 if you're a new believer, you're encouraged by what the older folks went through just like you. And if you're an older folk, you get to relive that excitement of a new believer. So it's helpful for all of us. My testimony, right, it's just like yours. I was dead in my transgressions, and then God called me. The Holy Spirit regenerated me. God justified and adopted me. And then day by day, I began growing more and more Christ-like because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Not a lot of me in there, is there? Christ's work, God's call, the Holy Spirit's indwelling. What's in there for me to be proud of and feel as though I'm some way to superior to somebody else? Nothing. We shouldn't be, be caring, we shouldn't be comparing our service and our gifts to other Christians' gifts and service. If you want to play comparison, compare your service and your gifts 
to what God has gifted you with and what he's given you the opportunity to serve with. There's a comparison you can make. Right? If you're in the parking ministry, because if you guys keep showing up like this, we're going to need one. Don't compare yourself with a person preaching and think that you're somehow less valuable. God has given you this opportunity to welcome and to smile and to speak with every single person that comes in to the property. Use it. Use what God's given you. We all have that opportunity in a different way. You know, we need to compare ourselves to the potential that our God-given gifts and God-given opportunities afford. Right? But our opportunities are not always helpful, are they? And Jesus points that out in the next few verses. Verses 7 to 9. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into an eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to enter life with one eye than two eyes and be thrown into hell. The hell of fire. It's a problem with such great worship music. I wear out my voice before I even get up here. It seems as though, reading through this quickly, oh, Jesus is changing the subject here. But he's not. He's showing another issue that we present in the church and is going to have to be dealt with by us directly and together. Temptation is the offer of sin that occurs in our lives that we are in a position to consider. Right? Sin is here in the world and tempts all who inhabit it. Jesus knew that. There's no denying it. There's no escaping it. But God said it's necessary. It's necessary because that's how he created us. With his ability to choose his will or our own desires. But we need to know that temptation to sin is not a sin, right? Jesus was tempted, yet he never sinned, right? Sin is when we mishandle temptation, when we accept that offer. But when we decline it, we glorify God. And just like that first principle, we get this warning about those who offer that temptation. Woe to them, not like, woe, stop horse, Woe, I would not like to have that on my record standing before God. Like that millstone tied around the neck, Jesus emphasizes the seriousness by saying, we should amputate the things that cause our sin. Better viewed as chopping things out of our lives that are continually offering us the temptation to sin. And we all share the capacity to sin. We share the vulnerability to sin. None of us are immune. So actually, temptations, whether acted on or not, really should be unifying us. Shouldn't be dividing us. Novel idea, right? Jesus has a lot of those. We need to see temptation as a common ailment amongst our body and offer to help each other. Help each other to skirt around it and to glorify God by refusing it. You know what I think of? This is really going to shock you. When I think about temptations in my own life, I think about Fred Flintstone. And he was going to buy Wilma a piano. But I don't know what he did with the money. He gave it to Arnold, the, 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 the paper boy or something. I don't know. He didn't have the money. And he went to the piano store, and the pianos were super expensive, and he didn't know what he was going to do. And, of course, he leaves the piano store, and he's walking down, and he goes by this little alley, and he hears, Psst, hey, buddy. He says, what, what? You want to buy a piano? Cheap. It was 88 Fingers Louie, and he sold stolen pianos. And um, it's simplistic and it's cheesy 60s stuff, but uh, it works for me. Um, 
because it didn't work out well for Fred, you know, um, and it work, won't work out well for us either. So um, when I'm tempted, I literally hear 88 Fingers Louie in the back of my head and, and think about what happened to Fred when he bought that used piano. Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't good. But just hearing that call, hearing that psst, is not sinful. And it happens to all of us. Temptation, it's a call to battle, really. Well, it's one that we all face. It's one that we can help each other win. That's why... Churches are not one-hour weekly events with encouraging songs and hip messages. Churches are fellowships of believers who are living a life with very similar challenges that we can help each other with. You know, whatever temptation gives you the most trouble, I would be shocked if there wasn't somebody else in the church that shared that with you. Really. You know, example, on our small group... Um, on Sunday, I had a question that I put forward. I don't exactly remember exactly how it was worded, but um, you know, what, what, what are your struggles in the Christian walk? You know, so what are your temptations to sin? And we went around the room, and I, I, there's between seven and fifteen people there usually, um, five to seven, two twenty nine Long Pond Road, Northwood, every Sunday. Hot dogs. Um, and I was a little surprised that over half the group gave the same answer. I had no idea. Got any thoughts on what it might be? How do we keep resentment from creeping into our lives about what's going on in our country? About the attacks on our country? Um, and about attacks on the church. You know, I, I, I didn't realize, I mean, I, I understand that. I fight that temptation. You know, I, but I didn't realize that it, that it was so predominant uh, in people's lives. And it ranged from some people who were a little bit tempted to be resentful by some people that were just ready to start amputating, you know? <laughs> so um, I, I just want to let you know that whatever you're going through as far as temptation, um, we can help you with that. Because that night we made some real headway. And it probably had something to do with why I preached what I did through this song. I'm sure it did. Um, it kind of spurred me into, into my mind kind of getting on to that. Um, we need to go through these challenges together. And, and that's Christ's next point. The Christians live and love together in a local church because of their devotion to each other. Right? Moving to, um, to verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. You still got the child on its left. For I tell you that in heaven their angels will see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Short teaching, short parable, um, takes on that principle we just examined on our personal temptations to sin and shows our responsibility, our duty, our honor of holding each other accountable for sin inside the church. Something that threatens their ability to live in that body. Really, this is a thing. It's what Jesus wants us to do. Not to punish us, not to embarrass us, not to serve justice, get back at people, look better at others. But to care for each other, to defend each other's place in the body. Right? Don't despise, Jesus says. Cataphraneo. Think little of. Okay? Don't think, don't think so little of another Christian that you're going to let them drift away into sin and stay there. Love them too much for that. 
Jesus knows what challenges the churches are going to face, and he's preparing us for these difficult tasks. This isn't easy. What's easy is to ignore it and mind your own business. But the point is, once you join a church, once you enter into a covenant relationship with a church body, your sin is our business. This is not my idea. This is the one big difference between playing church and being the church. Jesus knows us and he's preparing us for sinful people like us in a gathering like a church. We don't have the authority to say, what should I do about this? Jesus does. He's saying we need to bring people back from sin. And the next six verses shows us how he wants us to do it. Christians live and love together in a local church because of their devotion to the purity of the church. Verses 15 to 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take two or three others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Go over the basics um, carefully, okay? Someone sins against you. You go to them alone, and you explain that you've been hurt calmly, patiently, gracefully, Lovingly, The purpose here is to point out something that may be in their blind spot. Some of, the, some of us are famous for blind spots. Maybe it was unintentional. Maybe you misunderstood what happened. Maybe it wasn't even them. The majority of sin in the church, vast majority, get, gets worked out right here. But only if we do it. I mentioned here before, a church that sweeps sin under the rug pretty soon has a lump in the carpet big enough for everybody to trip over and everybody to see. Everybody can pretend it's not there. But it's there. But if you hit a brick wall there, someone refuses to repent of what is definitely a serious, legitimate sin, then you have to bring it to one or two others, not your buddies that already agree with you that you've given a heads up on the situation? You ask mature, faithful Christians that would be outside of personal involvement in the issue. You sit down with them and this other person and you get it all out on the table and you see what these people have to say. And if there's no repentance, then it says tell it to the church. And by this I don't mean taking a personal matter and expanding it to the entire church in every case. We need to be able to handle private and delicate matters in a way that doesn't make a situation worse. Right? I'm primarily talking about exposing innocent victims to a public forum on what they've been through if it has no purpose. It would start with the elders, not your friends, not anyone else. Bring it to the church is to bring it to those God has called to lead the church and let them hear the story and decide how to proceed. And if indeed the sin remains unrepentant and significant, the elders of the church under the direction of Jesus himself in full disclosure of the church body could ask that person to leave the body. And they would become like a Gentile, someone outside the faith. Or a tax collector, someone whose allegiance is in opposition to the church. They don't become an enemy 
They become someone that you pray for and hope they will snap out of it and return to the body, but only when they repent and understand the damage they have done. Further direction is given to us in, in, uh, in Titus 3.10 and 11. If it becomes divisive in the church. As for a person who stirs up, stirs up division after warning them once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. This is for the protection of the body. It's also good for the believer who's fallen into sin and refusing to be corrected. This is not fun and it's not easy, but God is going to give us some real encouragement on this process vital for us to follow because we're going to flow into here some of this stuff that, that gets really uh, misquoted. Jesus is, follows it up, showing us how important it is and how he will help us with this process by saying, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, okay? Context. This process of caring for each other for the church has its authority from God. It's what he does in heaven. He holds people accountable. He attempts to draw them back to himself when they fall into sin. But if they refuse, he allows them to reap the rewards of those actions. If someone says, I'm living in sin and I don't want to be forgiven. And we go through this process and then as a church, we can say that with the authority of Christ... Your sins are not here forgiven because you are unrepentant and you have to leave this body. I'll quote another pastor here which uses this verse to give this following sentence. Never is the church in greater harmony with heaven than when we are trying to maintain the purity of the church. Right? The Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Which leads us to another verse that hits the top 20 of misquoted uh, pieces of scripture. If two or three on earth agree about anything they ask will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's in the context of bringing a believer back. Right? Verses 15 and 16, two or three believers are gathered to try to bring that sinner back into repentance. That's what this verse is referring to. When we gather like this to maintain the purity of the church, we have the full support of God the Father in heaven. And the third promise Jesus makes is to lead us to courageously confront sin in the church is in verse 20, where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am among them. Right? When we undertake these steps, he's there with us. Right? This is not a command to get a quorum of three for our prayer group so it gets special power. It's a promise of his presence as we follow the command to deal head on with sin in the church. This is not some hip new way to do church or some old-fashioned way that is no longer relevant. This is God's plan for us to stay together as a body that he's joined to himself and joined to each other through faith in Christ. But it's still hard. No matter what side of this you're on. But, you know, some of you guys will share, you know, probably... Um, at least think amen when I say this. But, um, you know, you, you, what can be, I've never shared, I, I've never kept secret my, my difficulty with addiction at one point in my life. And if you've ever experienced something like that or seen somebody, you will know that at, that one day that you thought at the time was your worst day ever. by far has turned out to be the best because of the repentance it brought. True for me. Heard it last night. Heard it from a lot of people. 
You've got to go into it thinking like that. If you love somebody, you need to go through this process. You can't let them stay there. You know, God used... I didn't have a church at the time. All I had was excuses. Um, so I didn't have a church to bring me back. But God's creative, right? He used a heroin addict. He used a, a Vietnam vet that had severe um, uh, post-traumatic um, stress disorder. Um, he used the meanest cop in town and, and another guy. Um, and these guys drug me back. Whew. That day. We need to be satisfied in obeying this principle. And it's not going to look like puppy dogs and rainbows when we're in the middle of it. But sometimes obedience to God doesn't look like that. But it can later. Wow. It certainly can. The elders and I were looking at a, a sermon. Uh, it wasn't really a sermon. It was more of a, um, a, um, a pastor's um, teaching. Uh, one pastor teaching a number of other pastors on these particular uh, verses and by a gentleman named Herschel York, who um, is a pastor of a church, Doe Run Church, I think the name of it is, down in Kentucky. Uh, he's also um, a seminary professor uh, in um, Louisville. And um, he talked about, uh, and I would agree, that uh, the kind of sins that we're talking about here that would, would generate this type of action all the way down to the end to where someone is asked to leave the church into four categories. Um, gross immorality, unrepentant, and repeated lifestyle choice. The second would be doctrinal heresy. Um, top tier issues being taught inside the church that need to stop. Um, creating division intentionally. And, and the fourth one would be the sin of an elder. Um, so that's kind of how he split them up. And I would, I would agree. And the scriptural background for any of those, if you'd like, um, I can get those to you. But uh, it's something we can all go through together. And I'll know, be confident, that it's Christ's plan for the church. And our last point that he gives us is that Christians live and love together in a local church because of their desire to forgive and be forgiven. That's 21, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had. And payment was to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So this fellow fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly dis distressed. And they went and they reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt that you, um, all, the, all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all of his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive the brother, the brother from your heart. And Jesus finishes his teaching with a parable that outlines the first principle that should draw us together during difficult times instead of splitting us apart. You know, we've all been the recipients of this amazing grace amazing mercy and love and this forgiveness that he's given us. How can we deny an attempt to extend that similar 
grace and mercy and love to brothers and sisters inside the church. People that we share all these other things with that we've already talked about here. We can. And the, the, the parable illustrates it in an undeniable way. To refuse to forgive someone who is repentant and desires forgiveness is to deny the significance of the forgiveness that we were freely given. It's refusing to understand it, refusing to apply it to our lives. Forgiveness is such a foundational part of our faith that for a person to say they are a Christian but don't even desire to forgive others, it's a sin. It's a process. I shared a couple weeks ago with the struggle I'm having with forgiving a certain person. And um, I'm not there yet. But I'm working on it. I desire to. But I refuse to just say it. Because I know what it means. He wants a true release of our desire to see someone punished or hurt. He wants a release of our resentment and our hurt work through this process. Maybe you'll have to go through it slowly like me. Why do I have to go through it slowly? I don't know. Maybe if you have to go through this process slowly, it'll help you heal from something long ago in your life. Maybe it'll prepare you for something coming. Sorry about the scratch. Maybe he's educating you to help someone else understand this process. I don't know. All I know is we have nothing to be proud or arrogant about as far as forgiveness goes. We need God's forgiveness to be his child, and we need it every day afterwards to be in intimate fellowship with him. We need to have a desire for it, for between us, so that we can stay in this intimate fellowship with each other. All these principles work in that same direction. We need to love each other through these common difficulties. We need to love each other too much to let each other slip away. If you're a member of this church and you think that's going to be hard, you are right. It doesn't matter on which end of this you're on. If you have to confront a brother or sister or you're confronted yourself, it's going to be difficult. But I'll share something else with you. It's harder on the elders. Right? They're not sitting above you in judgment. We're leading you through this process. And it's even more stringent as applied to ourselves. When an elder falls into unrepentant sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. It's God's word to the pastor in Ephesus. 1 Timothy 5.19 so again, we're right here in this mess with you guys. Dealing with our common frailties, our struggles in this manner, is also should, it must eliminate gossip. If you see pride, temptation, sin, unforgiveness in the church, and you know that the elders know about it, you need to know that it is being dealt with appropriately. You need to trust us. There's no reason to talk about it. If you don't think the elders know about it, you can come to talk to me or one of the elders. But don't expect a full report if it's none of your business. This, what we're talking about here today, is how we will handle it. That's why we needed to hear the sermon here today. So don't think that we hold different standards for different people. Right? Don't think that any of this could be a personal vendetta against certain people. Right? We need to go through this process together so people don't think they're being held up to anything other than God's word and his teachings of Jesus Christ as the head of this church. Right? We don't want people to just leave, which unfortunately happens too often. You know, when, when, when this was written, people couldn't pack a moving van 
or, or get, get in their car and, and head you know, to, to Pittsfield or to Concord and go to a different church. They didn't have that option, right? I mean, there was a, I mean, maybe, you know, some big cities, maybe Antioch or Ephesus or Jerusalem might have had more than one gathering. That's possible, but still. They worked, they worked through their stuff, and I think that, you know, the, the, the technology and the, the mobility of modern culture makes packing up your marbles and leaving um, too easy sometimes. We're held to a better standard than that. We can all do this if we look to Christ for leadership and we're tuned to that same fork. Jesus knows us. He knew the troubles that we would encounter as a church when he taught these principles. Our sin and our reluctance to confront sin is well known to him, but we need to get over it and we need to obey him. Because when it comes to decisions in the church, he has to be the head. That's not just something we say here. We need to teach this now so we can live it in the future before a situation comes up. So be prepared for this in how we deal with issues here. It's what Christ said to do, and that, that's as far as I need to uh, go as far as an explanation on why we're doing it. Um, like I said, the church is growing like crazy, and uh, there's people coming from all different kinds of churches and all different kinds of backgrounds and all different kinds of teachings. So um, before we head it off into First Samuel next week, um, I wanted to do this because it's what I outlined as a vision, um, ministry, leadership, development, and uh, hopefully it flows from the top down and you know what we're doing and why we're doing it. So uh, I'll close this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we look to you to be tuned to how you want this church run. We don't want any other advice. We don't want any other knowledge to impede our relationship with you. We installed Christ as a leader of this church. Please help us to keep him there, to keep us in check, to keep us from falling into the sin that temptation leads to. And Lord, if there are any here that have not understood and received that initial forgiveness of their sins, by the sacrificial and atoning death of Christ on the cross, I pray that they would come humbly before you and then that you would allow us to come alongside them and help them grow in Christ's likeness. Let us thank you for this time. Let us thank you for this body. And let us thank you for your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And then to lead us in a time of... Um, Corporate prayer, I'd introduce our elder uh, Mark Cronus and say goodbye to our internet audience. Goodbye, internet audience.